Hello, and welcome back to the overview of British Battlecruiser Doctrine and Design. Continuing on from the previous video, we enter into World War I, the Great War, and the third generation of British Battlecruisers. For background, entering World War I, the British had ten Battlecruisers to hand. Six of the first and four of the second generations. Tiger having just barely come into service at this point. All of these ships were, whether first or second generation, following the same second generation doctrine by this point. Hunt enemy battlecruisers down and join the battle line as needed. Early battles in the war would prove the success of this concept of battlecruiser design. The British battlecruisers would chase the German SMS Goben merrily across the Mediterranean, the German ship unwilling to fight against her pursuers. Politics were the only saving grace here, as the British were not yet formally at war with Germany and couldn't open fire. When they were at war with Germany, the Invincibles would prove the worth of their original concept, as they would completely ruin the German East Asia Squadron, including two of the most modern German armored cruisers. For ships designed to smack down any armored cruiser in the world, this is perhaps not a surprise, though it does show the worth of the design and would shape later British choices with battle cruisers. The last indication of the success of this doctrine was at Dogger Bank, where the Splendid Cats would show the Germans why Blücher was obsolete before she had even launched. Though they would fail to destroy any of the German battle cruisers, this was down to luck as much as anything else and heroism, as I covered in the video on SMS Sablitz, though it will become important later on because the British learned some pretty bad lessons from Dogger Bank. That said, the arguable true tests of the second generation and the first generation ships following the second generation doctrine would be the Battle of Jutland. It is here where people often decree battle cruisers as that dumb idea that should never have been built, the ships that like blowing up, poorly armored death traps, any anything you want to call them right here. And yes, the British did lose three of their total battle cruisers here. Invincible, Indefatigable, and Queen Mary. They came very close to losing four, because Lion would have sunk were it not for one heroic man, just like what happened at Dogger Bank with Sablitz. This is not a knock on battle cruisers, nor British doctrine thereof. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Admiral Beatty and the British battle cruisers at Jutland were doing really dumb things that were completely unnecessary and would not reflect on the ships or their doctrine. The Germans fought in more or less the same way as the British did by this point, using their battle cruisers as a counter to enemy ones and as part of the battle line as a fast wing, when necessary. Yet the Germans only lost one, the exact same doctrine, more or less. But all they lost was Lutzow, which was pounded to hell and back. And while they almost lost Sadlitz and a couple others, they survived. This would tend to indicate that battle cruisers are fine. Yes, the German ones have more armor, but they also took way more of a pounding, so it balances out. Even Tiger took a hell of a pounding, but she was never at any real risk of sinking. The reason the British lost three of their ships was not due to doctrine or lack of armor or any such thing. It was down to absolutely pants-on-head insane battle power handling and highly explosive cordite. There was a desire, like I said, they took the wrong lesson from Dogger Bank, to increase rate of fire as much as possible so they could get as many hits in as possible. This was not a good idea. The British removed safety features and would even store ammunition and powder in the turrets themselves. As a result, when these things were getting hit, they would burn and catastrophically explode. If you put an American ship or a German ship and are legitimately putting your powder and shells inside the turret, 
when the turret gets hit, you're gonna explode. It's nothing to do with bow cruisers. Battleships would have had the same problem if they got hit in the same way. Of course, this would not stop the British from promptly doing the exact same thing and taking the wrong lessons from Jutland when it comes to HMS Hood. But for now, the third generation. There were four bow cruisers built and completed during the Great War by the British. HMS Renown, Repulse, Courageous, and Glorious. There's also HMS Furious, but she was a weird bow carrier thing and will not be covered here. Renown and Repulse were honestly something of a retrograde step, moving backwards towards the first generation in design. This is largely because our old friend Jackie Fisher had returned to his position as first seed lord and had some interesting ideas in regards to the ships. More so the Courageous Sisters, but they also impacted on the Renowns. Most notably in this case, in their armor protection. Now again, the armor protection wasn't the issue at Jutland, but reverting the Renowns to indefatigable levels of armor, 6-inch belts, you're just asking for problems there, especially as guns are getting bigger and bigger. Furthermore, they took the second generation concept of trading firepower for speed and did it by mounting three 15-inch turrets instead of four like in the equivalent battleships, the Queen Elizabeth or Revenge classes. This was due as much to save cost and get the ships completed quickly as anything, but it is an interesting note here. These two ships would be the fastest of the British battlecruisers. Intended for 32 knots, they could get up to closer to 33 on a good day, just like Tiger could be faster than she was supposed to be. It's not quite the insane 35 knots the Americans wanted out of the early Lexington designs. Still, though, it is showing Fisher's back because that is a very heavy focus on speed in favor of firepower or armor protection. Renown and Repulse were, in many ways, the ultimate version of Fisher's desires. Ships that had the bare minimum of effective armor, but with heavy firepower... In spite of missing a turret, they actually had a heavier broadside than Tiger because the guns are bigger. And extreme speed. That they earned these features as much due to the need of, for speed of construction and saving money, because, you know, they had to save money, was an incidental point to Fisher, I imagine. However, those two ships are positively conservative and boring in comparison to their stablemates in the Courageous Sisters. Courageous and Glorious, or Outrageous, as the British sometimes called them, were, as mentioned in the Lexington video and the last video, called Large Light Cruisers by Fisher. At the time of construction, the British government was flatly refusing to authorize any more capital ships, focusing instead on escorts for convoys because of the U-boats and stuff like that. In a thing familiar to anyone trying to skirt rules... Fisher called his bow cruisers large light cruisers to go, yeah, totally, they're not capital ships. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. That he got this past the British government is something of a miracle, though the poor ships themselves might be prone to disagree. At any rate, the big light cruisers were the final word in Fisher's speed is armor doctrine, with all the flaws that this entails. Their armor was the next best thing to non-existent, at 3 inches maximum. They only carried two twin 15-inch turrets. They were so lightly built they could barely even use those guns without damaging themselves. Yes, really, that was a thing. And the bending issues endemic to bow cruisers were severe in these ships. By all rights, they were really failures of design in their original form and would prove far more useful to the British when later converted into aircraft carriers. The same could be said for Furious, but again, she was honestly never built as a pure battle cruiser anyway, so she'll get her own video later. This is the last point where Fisher is really relevant, by the by. 
as his harebrained Baltic scheme was the reason these ships were built. Because, of course, the idea of invading Germany through the Baltic is exactly what the British should have been doing when they, Gallipoli was proving they were terrible at it, and they were already having issues finding enough troops as it was. Moving right along, though, as Fisher exits stage left, the fourth generation is really just one ship, thanks to the Washington Treaty. Originally intended as one in a class of four, HMS Hood was the only ship of her class built. The Admiral class, as they would have been called, was enough of a break from previous designs that it does deserve to be called the fourth generation, though it was not as big a break as Hood herself may indicate. The original design had armor thicker than Renown, but thinner than Tiger, at about 8 inches or so. The main break from previous designs was in firepower, as she finally matched the contemporary battleship designs with four twin 15-inch mounts. I suppose it's not inaccurate to call them renowned with one more turret in this regard, it's not completely accurate either, but quite the reversal of previous designs, isn't it? At any rate, the Royal Navy, in spite of Admiral Jellicoe correctly identifying the cordite and ammo handling issues, took the wrong lessons from Jutland, as I said earlier. Believing they lost their ships due to a lack of armor protection, Hood, the only one of her class actually laid down properly, was radically redesigned on the stocks. Her armor protection was extremely increased, rising to 12 inches in raw thickness and inclined at an angle to give it even higher real protection. This was not a bad idea, as Hood's initial armor was a bit on the thin side, but it's missing the point of Jutland, and there is some argument to be made that's why Hood was lost later, but no one knows exactly why Hood sank, so I'm not going to get into that here. It also kind of made her rest even lower in the water than she was originally going to, leading to many future jokes about her being the largest submarine in the Royal Navy. Perhaps more pertinently, it would lead to her three sisters never being completed. They were constantly being redesigned even further than Hood was, to the point that eventually the Royal Navy declared it would just be easier to build entirely new and more capable ships instead. This design process would eventually lead to the final battlecruisers of the Royal Navy, and the end of the fourth generation, the G3 design. Never progressing far enough to get a proper name, this ship was... Look, I'm going to get a bit snarky here again. If you can argue Hood was a fast battleship, and it really is easy to argue that point, the G3 was certainly a fast battleship at least in isolation. She was considered a bow cruiser largely because the contemporary N3 design had slightly, and I'm talking like an inch of raw thickness, heavier armor, larger caliber guns, 18 to 16 inch, but the same amount of them, and was slower. In isolation, purely on her design, the G3 is a fast battleship armored more than pretty much any other battleship in service or under construction, faster than them, and even more heavily armed. That she's a battlecruiser is almost entirely just because of the N3 existing. Honestly, I grant you, in a world without Navy treaties, assuming no one is bankrupted, battlecruisers might have become something more like the G3 as a general rule, while battleships became ever more ludicrous and ridiculous in how big they were. Then again, if the Yamato was any indication, they'd probably just become quicker anyway, and then you have to wonder what the point of a battlecruiser is. But again, and this will become relevant in later videos, the British call them battlecruisers, so shall I. I will call ships by what navies call them, not by what popular culture calls them. The G3 design, in this regard, was heavily armored, at about 14 inches at its thickest. To go back a tick, the N3 was about 15 inches at its thickest. They carried three triple 16-inch gun turrets in what might be one of the strangest layouts ever planned to put to sea, 
they're not quite all forward like the Nelsons or the French later battleships. The superstructure is placed ahead of one of the turrets and behind the other two, so you get this kind of weird lopsided look to them. Which is fine if your intention is only to fire broadside, but it does really limit their firing arcs. That aside, they were fast, equivalent to the Admirals at about 32 knots. At least in design, once they were built in practice, it's hard to say. But they were, truly, the fusion design that Fisher had pushed for. A battleship with the speed of a battlecruiser. A fast battleship. Or, because British, a fully armored battlecruiser. Either way, the G3s would be killed by the Washington Naval Conference, and HMS Hood would remain the ultimate British battlecruiser, that is really a fast battleship. No further designs were ever seriously contemplated, with the last British capital ships being fast battleships. Here is thus where British battlecruisers end. What began as big armored cruisers intended to follow that role as foreign station flagships, or commerce raiders or protectors, ended as either battleships with less guns and armor, or, for all intents and purposes, fast battleships. It's interesting in a way. While the Americans decided they wanted to have less armor, in spite of being fully capable of building an equivalent to Hood, the British wanted ever more armor. This is forever chasing after the Germans, who had heavy armor from the start, and were, if anything, even more keen than Fisher on the fusion design. It is also very much not what people think when they hear Battlecruiser, isn't it? A little postscript to add here. I know I tend to get a little bit snarky and such with these videos. One of the things I notice with all the copycats of Drac, or at least a lot of the copycats, it tends to be sort of dry, rote repetition of sometimes Wikipedia articles, let's be honest. Even if they do the research, it's really dry, droning on, stuff like that. I'm trying to get my personality to shine through in these videos, and that does tend to lean to snark and dry humor. I apologize if that's not your thing, but I want to make these videos as interesting as possible, not just dry reading of history as well as the fact that I want to actually go over the hows and whys and not just read off the bullet points of what the ship's histories are. 